I'm Steven from Just Got Played. I'm here with a special guest, John, and we are going to tell you what we think about my story uh, from a Taiwanese publisher, Homo Sapiens Lab. But before we get into what we like and don't like about the game, I'm going to give you an overview of how it's played. In my story, everybody starts with a player board with these trackers for the different resources. Uh, you start with a deck of cards because this is a deck builder. But the first decision you have to make is you have to pick one of the occupations that you're dealt. So they're both going to be time one occupations. Uh, and you can see that the symbol is occupation. So you pick the one that you think you want to do. Uh, and you don't, these are normally the resource costs to adopt this as a job. You don't have to pay that, of course, at the beginning. Um, but you take one, you make that your starting occupation, and then the other card actually gets shuffled into your deck. So the way that a turn goes, and it's all right here on this player board, uh, you do the planning phase. So normally, you would deal yourself four cards. So I'll take four cards off the top of my deck. Uh, you can see that uh, this one here gives me uh, health or whatever that symbol is. Um, this is, gives me the education symbol, so I'll give myself one of those. Uh, this one gives me happiness, so I can move that marker. Uh, and then this is financial uh, money income, right? So I can do one of those. Now, if I look over here at my engineer, if I had played a blue card, which I did not, I would get an extra money, but uh, I also have this ability, um, which is for every book icon that I play, I get to draw another card. And so you can see I did play a book, so I draw another card, and this is the wild uh, symbol, all right? So I can use that as any resource that I want. Now, I mentioned that having blue cards is important because if I played one of those, uh, it would have given me an extra benefit. So. In the next phase, the exploring phase, uh, I might want to choose a card that's blue. Uh, if you look, there's two uh, different rows of cards, and I'm just going to go ahead and move these out of the way now that we've, uh, you know, sort of collected the resources just so we can see better here on camera uh, what's available. There's this row are the life story cards. These will uh, go into your hand and they will always stay in your deck. These are occupation and project cards. Again, so you can see occupations, this symbol, these are project cards. You can actually complete these cards and add them to your CV uh, along with whatever your current occupation is. Uh, or you can just keep them in your deck uh, for the rest of the game. You have to take something uh, from one of those every turn and everything is gonna cost you some time. Uh, so you're going to age uh, every turn. So if we look at the cards that are available here, I did say that the blue cards would probably benefit us. Um, some of them are sort of expensive though. So if you see here, this card uh, costs two time, three money, and three books. I don't have that. Now, if you are missing something, obviously I do have one wild, um, So, uh, but you can also spend time. So I can spend years of my life uh, in exchange for that. But you can see here, you know, I. I only have one of the three money required, only have one of the uh, three books required, and so that would be four that I could use my wild. This would cost me three years of extra time, including that two extra years to take that card. It is worth four points at the end of the game, and it is a blue card, although it doesn't give us any other uh, benefit during the course of the game. So something that might be a little more reasonable might be, say, this card. All right, so the blue card is nice for us. This also gives a house symbol when it comes up. You don't start with a house uh, in your deck, uh, so you would always have to use your wild if you needed the house symbol for something else. So if I look at this, this would cost me two money. I don't have two money. I have one money, but I have my wild, right? So I could spend those two resources. I do have the book, and now I would just have to spend one time uh, in order to take this card, and then it would go in the discard pile with the other uh, cards that I had and would get shuffled and would come out. So I'm gonna set this aside for the second so you can see that there is a track here. Um, whoever is currently in the back, so this was my player color, moves. So I only spent one time, which is one year, so I would just leapfrog to the next year and I would go to the front of that line. If I had spent two years, uh, I would have gone there. 
But as it is now, I'm only going to move one, which means I'm going to go again before the yellow player goes. Because whatever the yellow player did on their, on their turn, they spent a lot and moved forward. You're going to keep doing this, um, moving forward on this timeline. Once uh, every player is past this 30 spot at or past this 30 spot, then the first reunion is going to come out. So there's four uh, reunion cards. We're going to randomly take two of those. Uh, and it's going to specify the two uh, types of reunions there are. And then we're going to take these cards and we're going to fill out these achievements. All right. And so now this is another option of what you can do on your turn. Um, so as you can see uh, listed on the board, another thing is, uh, so there's complete a project, switch to an occupation over there, which uh, we haven't talked about those yet. But instead of getting a life story or an occupation or project from the board here, uh, you can attend a reunion. So to attend a reunion, you pay whatever the cost is up here, and then you take one of these face-up cards, and all of these cards give you some benefit uh, victory points at the end of the game. Uh, so for instance, this one is for every occupation in your CV, because you can change jobs, you get three victory points. This is sets of colors. Uh, each card in your most color is two victory points. So if you have seven blue cards, this is actually worth 14 victory points uh, at the end of the game. All right, so those will continue on until you get to this, uh, at which point you will discard these, and then you will pull out two new uh, reunion cards from this other deck. So here's two more, for example, and you would wipe all of these and replace uh, all of those achievements. Uh, and you will continue on until if you uh, end your turn at 50 or higher, age 50 or higher, you retire, which means you stop playing uh, until everybody else is finished. Uh, if you go past 50, you can see there's some negative victory uh, points here that you'll um, incur. Now, one thing that I didn't talk about uh, was changing your occupation uh, or completing a project. So I did mention, so this, for instance, is my current occupation, okay? So I'm an engineer. Well, let's say we had reading habit in my hand. And, and on my turn, one of the things I did was I played uh, reading habit. And let's see, well, that one maybe even allowed me to draw this, allowed me to draw an extra card. This triggered my money. Um, so one of the things that I can do, remember, is I can complete a project or switch to a new occupation. So this is a project. It's down uh, because I played it from my hand that turn. This one requires me to spend two time and two health. So you can see here, uh, I have one health and then I actually have a wild. So on this round, I would be able, uh, as sort of a secondary action to doing one of these things, is I could take this project and I could slot it under my CV. And now you can see that whenever a blue another blue card comes out, so for instance, say this card uh, was in my hand next round, uh, that would trigger me getting an extra coin and getting an extra card. Uh, and then the same thing if I had a green card that I played, like perhaps this was one of the cards in my hand and that one came out, uh, I would get uh, an extra card. Now, if both of these came out, it wouldn't matter, that would only trigger once. If I had multiple blues, it doesn't matter. This still only, these only trigger once. Um, so you could do that with project cards. Now, if you wanna change your occupation, it's a lot like completing a project. You just have to pay what's here. So two time, uh, three money, uh, and a book can allow you to change your occupation. So I could change from being an engineer to being a lawyer. I still leave this down here, so I have that benefit. Uh, but now the lawyer gives me one money uh, each turn, and then also I get one of these bonus book cards. All right, and so when I switch the occupation, I decide what color do I want this to be? So I could say, wow, you know, I'm really doubling down on blues, so I could just decide to have a blue book. Or I could say like, well, you know what, that's nice when I get some green things too instead, so I could have uh, a green book. All right. And so again, you just keep going on until you get uh, to age 50, and then you add up all your scores. You'll get points from a lot of different things. Uh, so you could have uh, completed project cards are worth points. They're not worth 
uh, if they have the point symbol on them. They're only worth the points if they've been completed. Uh, cards, life story cards in your hand are worth points. Achievements can be worth points. Uh, you're going to add up all of your resources, and we like to do this actually on the player board uh, just for to make it easier to count. But you could add it up and say like, well, I have four health or three um, houses in my entire deck in CV. And then whoever has the most of each of those gets five points uh, and two points for second place. Uh, you can lose points for going over age 50, and then you total it up, and you see who got the most points. And then, of course, you can also, you know, tell an interesting story based on your CV and deck if you want to. All right, well, that's a general overview on how the game is played. So let's go back up top, and uh, we'll tell you what we think of it. All right, so... That's, you know, just an overview, not all of the rules, definitely not a tutorial, don't play the game from what I just uh, listed, but uh, that is basically how my story works. So, all right, uh, let's just kick it off with uh, what we like about the game. So, John, why don't you tell me what you like about the game? I think the biggest factor for me is the theme. Uh, there's a lot of games that have just tacked on themes and it's just like, hey, this is a game about this, but the mechanics don't play that out. However, in this game, I think that it's probably the biggest marriage of mechanics and theme of any board game I've ever played. Uh, and it just worked really well. Every action you're taking, everything you're doing matches up with what the theme is supposed to be. And honestly, it feels like somebody took the game of life, the classic board game, and updated it to a, a new setting. And it works really well. So I, I really enjoy the marriage of theme and uh, mechanics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I, the reason that I bought this game, I, I'm not really big on deck builders. So the reason that I bought this game was the theme. You know, I have this other game, The Pursuit of Happiness, uh, mm -hmm. which it's got some worker placement mechanism, et cetera, in that game. Um, and, it, you know, you build this story of your life. But that game is a lot more in depth. There's a lot more going on, a lot more rules. It takes twice as long, at least, to play. So, you know, I, I was uh, intrigued by this game. So absolutely, I, I bought it for the theme. And like I said, I'm not really big on deck builders, but this had an interest, interesting twist on deck builders, at least for me, something that I'm not very familiar with, which is, you know, you've got those cards, uh, the project cards or the, even your occupation that you make part of your CV. Mm -hmm. And those, you know, they have that color coding that triggers off the cards that you play out of your hand. So you've got this interesting conundrum, right? Like, sure, you want to have, say, a lot of red cards in your CV so that when you trigger a red card, you get this, you know, whole bunch of stuff to happen. But if you complete these projects or, or change your occupation to these cards, they go in your CV and now you don't have red cards in your deck to trigger, you know, the actions that do all those red card bonuses from your CV. So it's, it's got this interesting push or pull, like, do I, should I keep this card in my deck or should I make it part of my CV? And um, I am not familiar with another game that sort of makes you make that interesting decision. Well, it is also an interesting decision throughout the game. You kind of have to look at the age you are and how much time you're going to have left and decide when do I want to change my profession? When do I want to try to upgrade this? And the cards that you were talking about that are in your deck, your projects, your occupations, you can use those as long as you want just for their base effect. And then whenever you have enough resources in a turn to be able to do two, it's really action efficient to be able to do that. And it just it flows well. So you kind of have to start the game out and go, this is the profession I'm going to put in my deck. I'm going to use it for X amount of time. Once I've gotten that use out of it, I'm going to make it my new profession because that does cover up your old ability uh, and replaces it with the new one. Uh, and and it combos off of that. So I think that does make it a little tough for new players to get in the game because there's certainly times where you want to be doing certain things and it's really easy to not catch that. But it doesn't make it a hard to learn game. And after one play of this, it's pretty easy to see that kind of balance that you're looking for. And it opens up all kinds of interesting counterplay for future games. So it's a really easy to get into game, but that mechanic is so meaty when it comes to decision making that 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 single mechanic alone adds so much variety. So each game is going to feel a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. So now this is interesting because you mentioned, all right, if you've got that project card in your hand and you've got the resources to complete it, uh, then you, you can move it up to your CV. So I think that may be is a good point to segue into uh, what we didn't like about the game. <laughs> so, uh, so, John, I'll, I'll let you go first. Uh, well, for me, I, I mostly enjoyed the game. The only part that I didn't like is at its core, it is a deck building game. And I'm not a huge fan of deck building games. I think that they're really interesting and there's a lot you could do with it. However, I think all of them suffer from the same set of issues that are just inherent and baked into a system like deck building. And this game does not do anything to solve for those issues. So 
if that bothers you, then you might not really be able to get into this game. But if you enjoy deck builders or you just don't mind those mechanics, then it doesn't really take away from the game in any way and, and actually adds to the overall theme, as we were saying. So I don't think they implemented deck building enough to make it one of my favorite games, uh, not loving the genre, but it's not done in a way that's kind of distracting or downplays the game in any way it's just if you don't love deck building games this is not going to change your mind if you don't mind them then this is a great game that's going to play well yeah and and what you're talking about right is that is that randomness that you you have the things in your deck that you need in combination to achieve something but they just never come out in the combination so that you can achieve something right yeah you have to plan strategically but you have to act tactically on your turn because you only draw so many cards uh, as a matter of fact, on our playthrough of it, I was going through and I was trying to build a coin strategy. I got a lot of cards that had coins on them. At the end of the game, I had nine coin icons in my deck. Throughout the course of the game, I never got more than three coin icons on a single turn. And it's not a very long deck building game. It's uh, I think some people might get caught up in trying to build that engine and go, I'm going to really build to do this. So again, I think it's an issue of in your first game, there's so much going on and you don't really grasp the nuances and timing of things. So it's something I would do differently in the future, but it definitely stood out to me as something that I've experienced in previous deck building games. And it kind of uh, lowered the enjoyment of that a little bit, but again, it's just related to deck building itself and not specifically this game and mechanics. Yeah. You know, when we played, I was focusing on basically any opportunity that I had to bring out extra cards mm -hmm. uh, was what I did. Cause you know, I figured, well, a deck builders are, it's always better to pull out more cards. So I had, um, uh, so my occupation gave me an extra card. They gave me five cards. And then I had two or three other cards that could trigger, that could cause me to bring out cards. I think at one point I had eight cards out in one turn, right? Which is just double mm -hmm. what you normally have. And uh, it was interesting though, because it, it makes all of these resources available to me. I had all this stuff available to me, but most of the time I didn't even need it, right? I was sort of, you, you know, um, unless, unless I was trying to do those reunion cards, which took a ridiculous uh, amount of resources. But if I was just trying to get something off the board, I, most of the time there was something in the cheaper area that was good enough. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, even the stuff in the expensive, even with my huge tableau of stuff that I pulled out that round, I mean, I, I wasn't even able to afford those, not without spending some time anyway. So, you know, um, it, it was interesting from that perspective. I, and I didn't feel like the reading cards were hard to get. Um, and that's, Fine. I think we all managed to get one, though, when we played four players. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, it was hard to get the resources to get one of those without spending, you know, a bunch of time. But it, it did seem like the achievements that you got for going to the reunion were not very well balanced. And I think that's maybe what I didn't like. Um, you know, I... I let's see. I I took one card and it was only worth four points to me. I thought it was going to be worth eight, but then somebody took that marriage card that would have helped. And um, uh, you know, somebody else who played with us had one. I think it was worth nine, but I got one that was it was two points per uh, card that had my most common color on it, and I had seven red cards. Right, that was fourteen points. That's that's a lot of points, right? Uh, I don't actually remember what our final scores were at the moment, but 14 was a large portion uh, mm -hmm. of it. Um, and then so, so yeah, some of those bonuses really four or five, eight points in that one, 14 probably would have been even more points for you if you had gotten it. Right. So it was just sort of like, yeah. you know, who, who got to go first <laughs> when the reunion came out and could actually uh, go to the reunion and claim that card. So, you know, I was a little uh, and maybe maybe with more plays or something, I, I would see some nuances I don't see here. But yeah, it does seem there's a little bit too much luck in, well, I, I got the good achievement card before you got a chance to get it. Sure. And and there was a lot of disparity. I got a card that was worth three. Uh, you had one, I think it was worth four. The winning player had two. One was worth five. One was worth 14. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot, there's a limitedness to this game as far as like what you're looking for and what you're doing. Uh, and there's some cards that come out and they are going to be 10 plus points for every player in the game. And there's some cards that come out that go at best, if you were able to combo two more cards off of this, you're going to get nine points out of it. So I don't think that those objectives are, are strictly balanced. However, at the end of the day, the winning score versus the last place score was not that large of a margin. So while they were doing that, other on your turn, you, you may not necessarily get a reunion card, but you can get other things and do other things and get other points. 
And again, I think it was because our first playthrough, and I think there's a lot of this. This is a deep strategy game, even though it doesn't appear to be on its surface. And I think after playing a first game of that, we go, okay, I see what's happening now. And you can tailor your play and you could probably play four times better on your second game as you can on your first game once you know what you're looking for. So I think that a lot of people are going to have an issue with playing this for the first time of just trying to get the rules down, understand the nuances of when to do certain things. Um, and then they might feel a little bit of the sting of the, the randomness in deck building games. However, I feel like it's so well designed that on a long enough timeline, you play it two or three times, you're going to catch all those nuances. And a, a group of people who are all on the same level of knowledge about this game are going to have a really directive game where they're all fighting for points. And it may be a couple of points separating first, second, third. Um, so all of my issues, especially the deck building element, are addressed when you know more about the game and can be built around. I shouldn't have built nine coins. That wasn't the right idea. It didn't come up. Uh, and in the future, I would change that. And I think that you're able to mitigate a lot of that randomness when you know specifically what you're looking for and you're not wasting actions buying cards that are giving you diminishing returns. So it's a little bit clunky on its first playthrough, but even then you can see the beauty of the design behind it. And it's a game where you go, okay, I want to play that again. And here's what I'm going to do different with this, this, and this. And those kind of games are ones that elicit uh, the most reaction for me because it does keep your mind thinking like, oh, this is what I want to do differently. And, and you know, every game is going to feel different because of that. So definitely yeah. challenges. Yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, you know, I felt the achievements were particularly balanced, but you can't build to an achievement card either since you don't know if it's going to come out or not, right? You can't from the get-go say like, well, I'm just going to collect red cards so I can get that one achievement card. And then, you know, uh, because one, you don't know what the cost of the reunion is going to be, right? You don't know if the one mm -hmm. that's going to come up that takes three houses or not, because houses, you know, houses aren't normally used to buy like the other resources to get uh, life story cards or project occupation cards. So like, do I need houses or not? I don't know. Is that reunion going to come up? So, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to need to be able to go to the reunion and then you don't know what achievements are going to come up. So you can't build to say like, well, I'm just going to get a lot of project cards so that when that one that gives bonus uh, victory points to project cards comes out, I'm going to grab that one because, hey, maybe it's not going to come out at all. Um, so um, it, it, it is nice to know what some of the options are and what's in the deck. I mean, that does give you an advantage, but it's not like a huge advantage because, you, you know, every game is going to be different. Sure. And, and I mean, not as much as an advantage, but as more of a any of the issues that I have, a second playthrough, you can generally prepare to avoid most of those. Um, and even to your example, even if you plan ahead and get lucky with what you uh, built towards to the reunion, you might not draw it on the turn where it's relevant. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'm not a fan of house rules in almost any game, but I feel like one rule you could change in this. So what happens is you draw the first set of reunion cards at 30. And then at 40, you draw the second set. What you should do is you should start the game not with the actual projects face up to know what they are, but the cost should be face up at the beginning so you know what you're building to her. And then when you hit 30, you flip the second set and go, this is what these are going to be so that you do have a little bit more deterministic uh, chance to build toward those things. I think with that one tweak and on a second playthrough, 90% of the the troubles I had with the game are resolved. And then really you're just hoping you don't get extremely bad RNG over the course of a long game. Yeah. Um, but those are prevalent through that first playthrough. And there it's always going to be a little bit of that because of that deck building element, but it is something that, that I think just a little bit of effort you can avoid. And I can really see this being somebody's favorite game yeah. because it does have a lot under the hood, uh, the theme, the look of the game, the mechanics. Well, and if you love deck building games, this is a great one because it doesn't feel like you're just purely building a deck and going through the motions. There's a lot of decisions to be made and a lot of pivoting to be done. So there's a, a lot of things I like about it. There's a few things I don't like, but those can all be mitigated over time. Yeah. And I think, to, you know, as you turn this back around to sort of a positive, I think there's one more positive that I want to mention that uh, we didn't mention before, which was those uh, young at heart cards. Right. So you start yes. with a uh, two wild cards uh, and one goes away once you're 30 and one goes away once you're 35. And it's nice because, you know, at the beginning, your deck has got really not very much in it. So, uh, you you know, you just, you don't have a lot to do if you didn't have those wild cards, the ability to to use those to, you know, get some things from the board, you wouldn't be able to sort of kickstart your engine. So I like that it lets you kickstart your engine and then they go away. I haven't seen that used in another game, uh, another deck builder either, but uh, I thought that was a really good choice here. Solid design to do. 
for sure. Uh, I prefer if only one went away because you sh- in deck builders you should always have a little bit of mitigation. Like, hey, my turn's not great, but I get this star, which is wild. I can spend on anything. So I prefer they started with two. One goes away at 30 and you keep the other one for the rest of the game, especially because there is at least one profession that gives you benefits based on the stars, which was my starting profession. But when I played the stars and got rid of them, I because it was my first playthrough, I didn't get another profession down fast enough. So my profession was essentially dead for, for several turns of the game, and I didn't pivot fast enough. Again, something I would do differently in the future, but uh, if you're going to have cards actually referencing those stars, and you always want a little bit of that mitigation, I'd prefer if they start with two and then go down to one mid through the game. However, it's not the worst. You have them two in the beginning, and then they just both eventually go around, around mid-game, because that calls your deck. This is also another slight negative, is that it doesn't give you the ability to call the cards of your deck. And in a deck builder, if you're not able to get rid of cards that you don't want, or what you would consider dead cards at this point, then you're more subject to that RNG. So it's an interesting concept. You take the wilds out, but it'd be nicer if you could take some of the other things out because there were certain points where I got to where I'm just like, I don't need crosses. I don't need them. I don't want them, but but they're in there and it's essentially a dead card. Also, if you buy point cards a little too quick, those gum up the works too. So again, all things mitigatable in the second playthrough, but definitely a little bit of a challenge to get through your first game and go, oh, it's halfway through the game. I've made so many mistakes. I'm not going to be able to recover from this, but I know what I'll do better next time. Yep, exactly. So uh, my story, uh, I don't think this ever received distribution in the United States, maybe not actual distribution in North America. I got it from a Canadian store uh, and I'm glad I did. Uh, I'm glad uh, that I got a chance to play it and uh, I'm glad that I own a copy so I can continue to play it. So uh, anyway, uh, I'm Steven from Just Got Played. This is my special guest, John. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. That is good positive feedback for us and it feeds the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions about this, you can ask them in the comments below. Uh, Or if you look in the description of the video, there's a link to our Discord channel. You can come over there and chat with us about games uh, or follow us on any of the social media uh, sites if you want or hit the subscribe button here so you don't miss any of our videos. But until the next time, thanks for watching.